In this demonstration, we're going to look at creating a virtual machine from the Azure portal. So let's head over there to begin. And here we are in the Azure portal. And one of the things you might notice if you have built virtual machines before is things have changed a little bit over time. And Microsoft continues to change this part of the portal. But we can go ahead now and click virtual machines and see I've already got one virtual machine there. Uh, that's just a Linux virtual machine I've got running. I'm going to add another one. We're going to build a Windows virtual machine at this point. So I'm going to click Add. And straight away now you get the Create a Virtual Machine panel that pops up. And you'll see they've added these tabs now across the top to make it easier to go forward, come back, you know, throughout the process in itself. Uh, if we go through though, click Subscription, you would choose your subscription that you want to provision this virtual machine into, and then choose the resource group that you want to use. Now I've already got a resource group created called AZ-Demo, where VM01 is currently in, but I'm going to add another VM to that resource group. So we'll continue to use AZ-Demo. I now need to give it a virtual machine name. So in my case, I'm just going to call this VM Demo uh, 01. And now I need to choose the region. So I can choose any of the Azure regions that I'm entitled to provision into. In my case, I'm going to choose East US. And next we have the availability options. Now if I click this, you will see that sometimes we will get availability zone, sometimes we will get availability set. So availability sets were covered in one of the lectures. And if you haven't jumped to that yet, you know, feel free to jump ahead to availability sets. Availability sets are inside the same data center, but allows you to have you know, two virtual machines in separate racks of power and network connectivity. Availability zones are in the same region, but they're in separate data centers in themselves. So it's another way to get additional redundancy. Now Microsoft is rolling these out gradually to all the regions. If you click this icon, it's blurred out a little bit there, but you can click the little blue thing that says view locations that support availability zones, and then you can choose those. But definitely encourage you to understand the differences between availability sets and availability zones because Microsoft is really emphasizing availability zones going forward. Next, we choose the image. So I'm going to choose from a Windows or Linux image here. These are all the standard ones available to you. And I can choose Windows Server 2016 directly from this pane. Now note, if I wanted to see all the images, I can click Browse All Images and Disks. That will show me everything available to me from my marketplace. But in my case, I'm just going to do a 2016 data center server. Next, we move on to the size. So I can click Change Size here. Uh, and this will give me all the different VM sizing options available to me. And I can do various filters on these. I can get rid of these filters if I want to. I can add additional filters. You know, right now it's looking at general purpose with premium disk supported at small sizes right now. So that's why I'm only getting a, you know, a handful right there. If I got rid of the small, it's going to certainly open it up to a lot more sizes that are available to me. And in some cases, your subscription may just not support that. Or perhaps you've also got a policy in place that doesn't allow you to choose specific VM types. Uh, but in my case, I'm going to go back up and I'm going to choose one of the B ones. I'm going to choose the B1MS. Uh, that option there, that's a one CPU, two gig of RAM. Supports two data disks, got a max IOPS of 800, includes a temporary storage drive with 4 gig on it, and it's using premium disks. And on the right, I can see my cost per month would be $15.40 estimated. Now, one thing to note with the B series, as you probably heard about when we did the lecture on VM types, the B series does use the concept of CPU credits. So when you do provision them up, they can take a little bit longer to build. The purpose of B series is really for web servers so that, you know, when they're not in use, they're generating credits. When they are in use, they're consuming from those credits, but you don't want to use them if you're running things at 100% all the time. However, they are very cheap to run for lab purposes. You've got like the B1S here, smaller memory version. You've got the B1MS, which is that double memory version of the B1, uh, you know, much cheaper to run, you know, for the purposes of your lab. But again, they take a little bit longer to provision. But if you select one, then go ahead and click select. Uh, and then that takes you on to the next section. So now we need to include our administrator account. And you'll notice that things like admin aren't allowed. That's a restricted word. If I go back and I just type in, say, my name, that is allowed and we can move forward with that. And then you can go ahead and type in your password. This is the Windows password to get into the machine.
Once we've got all that typed in and the passwords match, we can then move on to the inbound port rules. Uh, and this section is pretty important because if we want to RDP into the machine, say over the internet, we do need to expose that. So we can allow selected ports and we can choose the ports that we want to expose. So perhaps RDP is one I want to expose. This is great that they added those things aren't just open by default. You have to choose to allow those inbound ports to be open and you can further lock them down using Azure Security Center and just-in-time access as well. Uh, but for right now, yep, just go ahead and select RDP if you do plan on connecting into the machine after you've you know, deployed it, which you'll need for some of the subsequent demonstrations that we do. Uh, one thing to note is the one difference between Windows and Linux here is in Linux we could be prompted to generate a key and put that in here or we could use a user account. Windows we just use user name and password for the administrator account. If we keep going down the next thing we have is save money which is save up to 49% if you already own an Azure license for that Windows server. So if you already have one simply select yes uh, and choose your license type. You have to confirm that you have software assurance for that and that will reduce the cost that you pay for those Windows servers. So this is a great benefit. If you've got a lot of Windows machines that you move into Azure, you will get a cost benefit by already having that software assurance. But in my case, I don't. So I'm going to click no and then move on to the next panel, which is the disk section. So yeah, we have our disk types. And as you can see, this machine, because it is an S series, does support premium SSD as well as standard SSD and standard HDD as well. I'm going to just go ahead and choose premium SSD for my disks there. And then I can choose if I want to create and attach a new disk or attach an existing disk as well. So perhaps I deleted a machine, but I left behind a virtual hard disk that I want to attach to this machine. I could do that there. If I wanted to just go ahead and create a second disk, and here you can see I can choose my disk type. So if I want to use a different type to the one I used for the primary disk. So remember right now I've got that OS disk that's on premium SSD. I also have that temporary disk that's on a local disk associated with the host that the virtual machine runs on. So that has specific use cases where I want fast access to a locally cached disk. And then this disk, again, I can choose SSD, premium, standard SSD, or standard HDD. In my case, I'm just going to choose a standard HDD right now. Choose the name of that disk. That's the Azure name for the disk, not the name inside of Windows. The size, and then the source type. If I want to choose a snapshot or a blob that I already have of a VHD, uh, I can do that. But in my case, this is just going to be an empty disk that I attach with this virtual machine. With that, I click OK. And then we scroll down a little bit further. And then I can move on to advanced pieces as well. So if I want to use manage disks, the default now is yes, that's what we always recommend. But if I wanted to manage the disks myself, I could choose no there if I wanted to. Next, we move on to networking. And in networking, first of all, you're going to see details around the network interface. So when you create a virtual machine, a network interface card is created for you and is associated with the virtual machine. I choose my virtual network that I want to connect this virtual machine to. So again, I could create a new virtual network or just connect it to a virtual network I already have. In your enterprise, you'll probably have a scheme of networks and subnets that you want to utilize. Uh, choose the subnet. In my case, I just have the 10.0.0.0/24 subnet that I'm going to use and whether or not I want to create that public IP. So I can click here. By default, it will prompt to create it, but I could choose none if I don't want the public IP. So perhaps I'm connecting through my VPN or express route from my data center that I have. Uh, then I wouldn't need a public IP to access the machine, or perhaps I'm using a point to site VPN connection to get into the virtual network in Azure. Again, I wouldn't need a public IP, uh, but in my case, I want a public IP so that I can just RDP into it because this is an isolated Azure environment and I'm not connected in via any VPN or express route connection. Then we come across NIC Network Security Group. So again, on a subnet, I can have my network security group and I could just rely on the rules there, but I could also have a network security group associated with the network interface card of the virtual machine itself. Now I can choose not to. If I choose none, you can see that it says all ports in this virtual machine may be exposed to the public internet. This is a security risk. So obviously highly recommend you at least choose a basic one and then choose which ports you want there or you can choose an advanced one. It takes away that basic option for you there, but you would then configure that network security group more specific to the rules that you want. In my case, I'm going to choose basic. I'm going to choose allow selected ports and select RDP as we previously did. Uh, next, we have an option of accelerated networking. 
Now, accelerated networking is only available on certain instance types and certain operating system versions. So perhaps you've got Red Hat 7.4 and you wanted accelerated networking that is available on that machine on specific D-series versions of the instance type. And that allows faster networking between virtual machines that have accelerated networking enabled. Essentially, it bypasses one of the virtualization layers and goes directly to the NIC card and just gives better throughput all around. So that's when you would use accelerated networking. Next, we have load balancing. So if we want to, we can place this virtual machine in the backend pool of an existing load balancing solution. In our case right now, we're not looking to do that or load balance this with other virtual machines. So we will move on to the management section. So under management, you can see here we have a few things. First of all, we have boot diagnostics, so we can opt to turn these on or off. And generally, we just keep them on because it helps us diagnose any problems in the virtual machine. We have OS guest diagnostics. If you covered the monitoring section earlier on in the course or in some of the other videos we have, uh, this is where you can turn on those guest level metrics or you can just keep them off and just rely on the host level metrics from Azure. And the diagnostic storage account, which is where the diagnostic logs associated with those two things are going to be stored it will create one for you if you don't specify one for identity as will be covered later on in identity you can assign a system managed identity you know automatically for you and then we have things like auto shutdown so enabling auto shutdown is something I always always recommend you do in your lab environment turn it on choose the time you know whatever time zone you're basically in so in my case I am in you know central time right now so oh, gotta go back the other way so let's go to central time uh, US and Canada uh, and at 7 p.m. this machine will basically shut off automatically and that will save me costs in my lab and I can choose to notify before shutdown or not if I want to. Uh, next we have backup itself so one of the fantastic features about Azure is you have backup built in and it's as simple as click and enable backup choosing your recovery services vault if you have one or creating a new one right now and choosing a backup policy and there's already some of those already built in for you so if you do want to back up your virtual machine you know all production machines you should have this turned on by default especially if you aren't using some other third-party backup solution but for purposes of the lab I don't need to back up this machine so I'm going to turn that off and then move on to guest config now guest config is more focused around things like PowerShell DSC extensions, Chef, Puppet, etc. They're not something we're going to cover right now, but you will see them in a separate module in the course if you haven't done so already. So we're going to move on to tags. Tags are really just a way for us to organize our data. You've probably seen some tag in demos already, uh, but let's say I just wanted my cost center. In my case, my cost center is lab. I can use this point in time to go ahead and you know add various tags you know to my build. Finally, I can review and create, and this is great because it also gives us an option to download the template, and you'll see ARM templates and automation much later in the course, uh, but you can download the template for use in your automation tools right here, you know, before you go ahead and build it. But if you are happy with it, you know, check through everything, make sure everything is as expected, and then go ahead and click Create. And that will begin building your virtual machine. Windows machines, B-series, take about, you know, five to ten minutes to complete you know if you choose a d series on premium disk then they'll be you know created in much less time and finally you know linux machines a little bit quicker as well so plenty of options but you can monitor your deployment here uh, you can cancel it you know during deployment if you want to you can see the services in azure that have already deployed you'll notice like the ip the nsg the disks are all separate services you can watch them deploy there if you want to you can also go and see the template on the left hand side uh, you can still download it here if you want to. You can add it to your libraries if you want to redeploy, you know, similar machines. This is a good way to kind of, you know, create that ARM template and get it the way you want for deployment later, you know, via automation. But with that, this concludes this demonstration. And in the subsequent demos, you will see how to connect to your Windows or Linux machines.